All right, good morning. Good morning. We got some sunshine after the rain. That's good. Good. Does anybody need a Bible? There's one up here. There's some more in the back if we need to get them. Okay, we are in, we're just finishing up the letter to the church at Ephesus. But I want to share this with you because I thought this was pretty powerful. This came from uh, Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, an older man boarded a, a bus in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, and he knew he was going to have a long journey, about a 12-hour journey to get to where he was going up in the uh, highlands of Vietnam. His purpose was to deliver Bibles uh, to the believers up in this area. And so he he looked for a seat on the crowded bus he was riding, and he found an aisle seat, and he had this box of 30 Bibles with him. He put the box down close to the aisle, but his concern was, what was he going to do when they stopped at the checkpoints? Because he knew that they were always checking uh, for sometimes IDs and for packages that people had with them. So he wasn't sure how that was going to work. Well, right behind him getting on the bus was a, a police captain. And that captain happened to sit on the aisle right across from him. And seeing the box sitting there up close to the aisle, he put his policeman's hat on top of the box. <laughs> when they got to the checkpoints, the guy is still really nervous about what's going to happen. Uh, so fearful that they're going to find out he's got this box of Bibles. Well, they come on, they start checking IDs, and they're really interested in the packages that the, the people have. And so they come to this man, and here's his box sitting there. But they see the policeman captain's hat on the box, and they walk on by. He gets to his destination, and he gets to deliver the Bibles to the believers. Isn't it amazing how God works in just the little things that we wouldn't often think about, but in something like that, the Word was able to get to those believers. My word will not return void. God does things in marvelous ways that we can't even think or imagine. So that man walked by faith and God answered the prayer. Father, we're so thankful for today. We're thankful that we get to be together, that we have this freedom still. We know that many in the world don't have that. And we pray for your strength, for their courage, for their continued faithfulness. And Lord, help us sometimes in all that we have available to realize how blessed we are, to continually be thankful. And not only do we have salvation through the free gift of the Lord Jesus, but we have the opportunity to go around and to talk to people and to help them come into the kingdom as well. So we ask for your guidance, your blessing for the work of the Holy Spirit as we assemble to worship, not only for this time, but for Jason as he shares the message a little later. And Father, just continue to strengthen us. Uh, we know that our country is in deep need, and we pray for healing and for wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're looking at the letter to the church at Ephesus. I had some of these uh, this is a depiction of the Temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. Uh, magnificent structure, but people were focused on worshiping that goddess. Um, there was the Temple to Domitian, which again, emperor worship, very, very powerful and prominent through all of that region in uh, Asia Minor. Uh, we talked about what leaving your first love was about. And uh, we went through some of that, being not only leaving the love for Christ and believers, but probably related also to leaving your uh, focus on witnessing. And we talked about that. Uh, went back to the Old Testament. And remember, John is using the Old Testament a lot. 500 different allusions to the Old Testament. Well, even back in the Old Testament, God was telling Israel, why did you leave your love? Why did you leave me? Uh, he was the, the groom and Israel was his bride. Paul talked about it. Remember the last advice or warning from Jesus was this, that they would remember uh, what they had had in their relationship with him. They are to do some repenting. 
which means turn it around, change some habits, change some schedules, whatever you need to do, and then return or redo. Get back into those things. And we also talked about how that relates also to marriage or maybe any other relationship we have. That is what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to be united. His promise to the overcomers was to eat from the tree of life. Where was? Where do we encounter the tree of life? In the, back in the garden of, of Eden. And it was there for Adam and Eve. But they got... They, they couldn't do that after sin entered into the picture. But now look at the promise coming back. That they're going to eat from the tree of life. Well, uh, I put some of that material up there for you as I point out there was a tree shrine. According to a lot of the ancient uh, literature, there was a tree shrine in the uh, foundation of the Temple of Artemis. And that tree shrine served as kind of a place of uh, refuge for criminals that they, if they could get into the temple and get to that tree shrine, then they could have some uh, uh, freedom from uh, being prosecuted, I guess, and they could get relief. Well, the problem with that is, you know, once they got there, then they could go back out and continue their criminal activity. Well, isn't it interesting that John uses that image to focus on the overcomers will get to eat from the real tree of life. And we know that the focus for the believer now has been on our life has been broken at the cross, right? At the cross is where we can find redemption and eternal freedom. And so that's an interesting contrast here as we notice the connection that John makes uh, with the, the idea of the tree of life. Uh, it was described as being a kind of salvation for those criminals who could get there and uh, very different from the tree of life uh, in Ephesus. So let's move to Smyrna. And if you have any question or something you want to ask about in the, while I'm going through this, please do that as well. Uh, Smyrna, notice what it says about Smyrna. Let's just read through the, uh, the account together. These are the words of him who is the first and the last. Now what you're going to notice in every letter, except for one, there's going to be a characteristic of Jesus that heads the letter that was also a characteristic mentioned in chapter 1. Because in chapter 1 we talked about John's vision of, of the Christ, uh, the head, the robe, and all of that. So these are the words of him who is first and last. We know that was also mentioned in chapter 1 who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions, your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Smyrna was considered to be the crown of Asia, birthplace of Homer, who wrote the, uh, the Iliad, um, home of the Bishop Polycarp, who was martyred there in about 156 AD. Uh, some of you may have heard of him from church history. That city, Smyrna, still exists in modern day as the city of Izmir, third largest city in Turkey. So that's where it is on the map. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. Again, John uses Old Testament in Isaiah 46, and there are several passages in Isaiah that relate to these words. But notice what it says in Isaiah, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no other God. So John is again borrowing on that. On the coins for Smyrna were stamped the words first city of Asia in size and beauty. Now, why the significance of the reference to Jesus being first and last, being dead and coming to life? Well, in Smyrna's history, that actually happened. They were dead. They were destroyed in 590 BC. The city was destroyed and then rebuilt in 290 BC, for 300 years it lay in ruins. And then it was rebuilt. So that city did actually die 
and come back to life. You see what John is using things that actually happened in their history to relate again to Jesus and the fact that he is the one who has truly come to life and has the resurrection life in him. Notice also what Jesus says about their affliction or their crushing pressure. Uh, they had faith to stand up underneath of it. Uh, there's a Greek word that talks about that, kind of holding up or standing up under pressure. Jesus knew all about their struggle. He didn't lift it from them, but he said that he would be with them through it. Well, that reminds us of some of the affliction of Jesus, doesn't it? What did he go through for us? Well, you remember the struggle in Gethsemane where he prayed three different times and Luke says that he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like drops of blood. Father, if there's any other way, remember those agonizing words. And then, of course, the horrible flogging that he endured, the, the uh, nails being driven through his hands and feet on the cross, the mocking, the ridicule, all of that he endured for the joy of knowing that he was providing a way home for us, a way of forgiveness. And uh, so his words are to these believers, be faithful. There are no words of criticism. There is no warning to repent here in Smyrna. It's one of the two churches that they don't get any rebuke. They don't get any warning. They were standing strong uh, under pressure. And as Paul wrote to Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You say, well, what kind of persecution are we going through? Mm -hmm. In some ways, thankfully, not like some of the believers around the world, right? Because some of them, they don't have a place like this to meet. They're lucky they can find a home that they're safe to meet in. They're lucky to have one copy of the Bible share in many places. They're under constant threat of walking out their door and somebody arresting them or beating them or killing them. It's a strange, isn't it, that the church in Iran is now considered to be the fastest growing church in the world. What happened here? As we look through these letters, I think we're going to see some similarities some things we're dealing with. Our persecution will probably come a little differently, won't it? So far. Our persecution comes from maybe feeling like we're the weirdo who doesn't stand with the culture. Or being branded as different, strange. Those kinds of things. Jesus said to that church, that they were physically poor but spiritually rich. Smyrna was a wealthy city. So why did he say they were poor? What was going on, do you think, with the kind of persecution they were under? What was happening to them to make them poor? What do you think was going on? Anyway. They, were, they lost their jobs. They could lose their jobs. Exactly, because you're not you're not going along with the thinking of the, of the people of the city. You're not going along with what they believe in. Well, we don't need you around here anymore. What else? If they had a business, they might be able. They might lose their business. Now you think of some of the things that's gone on in our society not too long ago and still going on. You remember the bakery in Colorado that refused to make cake for the group, you know, the same-sex marriage thing? What happened there? Got a lot of flack, didn't they? I think it happened again, too. Yeah, yeah. it's still going on. Yeah, I'm saying those things are still going on. Wasn't there uh, not too long ago, uh, what, Chick-fil-A come under and they, they had this outpouring of support uh, for them? Uh, things like that are still going on, and that's in our day. It's in our time. So lose their jobs, they could lose their business if you might not even be able to trade with some of these places if you don't think like they do. Well, guess what happens today? If you don't 
if you don't go along with the thinking of certain liberal groups, you can cut off social media, right? Yeah. They don't want you to be heard. Well, does that sound like, uh, doesn't that sound a lot like the communist nation? Who uh, distributes the information they want you to hear? Well, what's going on here with us? So that was happening there. Many of them probably could have even had their homes robbed. I don't know, did I have the, yeah, the Hebrews 10 passage up here. The Hebrew writer reminds those readers that you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and a more abiding one. Don't throw away that confidence which has great reward. You have to know that your reward and your real possessions are greater than the things of this earth in order to stand faithfully. And that's what they were doing in Smyrna. That's what they're doing in Iran. North Korea, China, India, many other places today, uh, knowing full well that they could lose all of that. Uh, in places in the Sudan and Nigeria and Africa, uh, homes are literally being burned. They're being run out of their city, their villages. Now, uh, many of them are refugees. So Jesus called them, at one point here, a synagogue of Satan. Well, or in verse 13, later on in the program, we'll talk about the throne, Satan's throne. When it says synagogue of Satan, what do you think he's talking about? Well, a synagogue is what? Where the Jews worship. So to call them a synagogue of Satan, what do you think they were doing? Well, the Romans considered the, allowed the Jews to be exempt from military action, and, uh, and they didn't have to do the sacrificial uh, to the other gods. They exempt them from that. But what they did was they lumped the Christian sect in with the Jews. So when the Christians don't want to go along with the sacrifices to the gods and goddesses and they don't want to go along with the other things of the culture, the Jews are angry because it's messing them up. So they're going to be turning them in to the authorities. And today, in many places in the world, family members will turn other family members in to the authorities uh, to have them arrested or beaten. I don't know if we can really uh, identify with how horrible that might be to have one of your own loved ones turn you in to have you arrested because you don't believe the way they do. So they're called a synagogue of Satan because they are doing, they are persecuting God's people. The same way Paul was doing before he saw the risen Lord. So much of the pressure that they faced in Smyrna back then is still happening to believers today as we meet here this morning. The possibilities for the throne of Satan, and we're going to get to that here in a bit, are several. Uh, because it could be this the temple to the emperor. It could be a temple to gods like Zeus. Or as we saw in Ephesus, Artemis. They had numerous ones. Uh, Escalapius, the god of healing, uh, could be another one. Uh, the altar to Zeus. There are several possibilities as to what the throne of Satan could be. It could be just a combination of all of it because Satan was having his way with these cities uh, in this kind of culture and environment. Now today, there are certain places in our own country that you don't want to be at night, right? Or even during the day. Why? Because they're filled with violence. <laughs> Uh, abuse and all kinds of things that are going on that you don't want to be a part of. Well, that's going on in many of our major cities today. Look at what they were doing in the city of Portland and Seattle and all of those places. The violence and hatred that's going on. He also said to them, this is the altar to Zeus, a, a, kind of a picture of what that may have looked like. This was one of the, the theater in, in uh, Smyrna. Which again, these theaters were were large. The one in Ephesus held maybe twenty four thousand people. Um, the theaters were were built in such a way that, and we, when I did our Israel trip 
I got to set, you know, in one of these, and you can set up at the top, and you can have somebody talking normally like this down at the bottom, you can hear them just fine. They knew how to do the acoustics. Jesus reminded us in his words that we should enter by the narrow gate. The gate is wide that leads to destruction. And there's many who want to go that way. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And that's the way we want to be. So he also said, notice this, and I didn't have a slide on that, but notice what he says. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, if you think back to the book of Daniel, what happened to Daniel and his friends when they were uh, told to eat the king's food? You remember what they decided to do? Daniel said to the guy in charge, we'd like to change the diet. Test us for 10 days. It is just a, a marvelous miracle of how scripture comes together. John is using these references that he's so familiar with. And we want to be careful that we don't throw out these things that have lessons to teach us. But John knew that, hey, there were these young men who chose to be tested for this period of time to be faithful to God. And Jesus said, now some of you are likely to be thrown in prison. It's not, it's not going to be for a long time. Ten days may be a picture of a short time period, but you need to be faithful. If they were to come in, the authorities were to come in today and say, sorry, you're not going to be able to hold church here any longer. In fact, we'd like to know what your allegiance is to. Are you elite, your allegiance to Jesus Christ? Or we're going to take you down to the station. We're going to interrogate you. Probably throw you in jail for a while. What would we do? Some would face death. I mentioned Polycarp, bishop of the city there, of the church there for a long time, was, was burned at the stake uh, in 156 AD. But the promise is you'll receive the crown of life. Now, that is a reference to the victor's crown. Smyrna held athletic games, and so the winner of many of those games would be given a laurel wreath. Big deal. <laughs> Compared to trophies given out today, laurel wreath. Jesus says, hey, I'm giving you the crown that's going to last for eternity. Big difference. Interesting side note here. The emperor, when they would come, the emperor would come into a city like this, and remember again, they had tremendous worship temples and all of this going on. When the emperor would come in, he would be dressed like a god. I mean, dressed to the nines, wearing his robes and the crown, and, uh, and the captives would march ahead of him to be taken to a place of execution. Overcomers will not be hurt by the second death. That's eternal death. Overcomers will not be hurt by the second death. As I'm sure some of you have heard, those who were born once die twice. Those who were born twice die once. Pretty good stuff. Of the seven churches, only the church of Smyrna still exists. Only the Church of Smyrna still exists. Pergamum, verse 12. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to, to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna, I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. What's the characteristic of Jesus mentioned here? The one who holds the what? Sharp, 
two-edged sword. <clears throat> Pergamum is in modern-day Turkey, 45 miles north of Smyrna. It was a military fortress, hopeful, uh, foretold and political center. Um, came under Roman control in 133 BC. And G the symbol of Pergamum, by the way, is the sword. Now you see how John relates certain aspects of the cities to a characteristic of Jesus. Where do you find reference in Scripture to the sharp two-edged sword? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God is like a sharp two-edged sword that cuts deep into the soul and the marrow of who we are to tell us the truth about us. And reveal what we need. That's what the Word does. The Word is powerful. And it doesn't return void. Rome gave Pergamon the right of the sword. The right to capital punishment. Again, their symbol of where their city was the sword. Um, there is a battle going on in these cities. For the mind. Satan is after our souls, isn't he? He would love to have that control, and he's using all kinds of schemes to get us off track, if he can, spiritually, to get us off the paths of righteousness, onto the path of culture, and the path of death. Now again, Satan's throne, we looked at the synagogue of Satan. Here it is the throne of Satan, which we also refer to several possibilities uh, there was a temple built to Augustus in 29 B.C. Again, all these cities competed for having the best temple to the emperor. And they had one to Asclepius, the god of healing, whose symbol, by the way, was the serpent. And the symbol for the AMA today? The serpent. Temple priests would use snakes. Okay, this, this, this is a little bit troubling because... <laughs> They were actually used snakes in the healing process. If you were suffering and you believed in this stuff, you'd go to the temple and you would go in there and spend the night with non-poisonous snakes. Now, I don't care whether they're non-poisonous or not. I'm not going to willingly go into a place where there's snakes crawling around me at night. Now, maybe you like that, but I have no part of that. But these snakes, they would go in there and these snakes would slide over and if they'd be touched by the snakes, they thought this was the touch of the God. This God, Asclepius, would be touching them and that would bring them health and healing. So people came from all over to do this. Is it not amazing to you the things that people can be duped into? Are you kidding me? Well, some churches still do that today. I know, I'm just thinking about the snake hammers who still... <laughs> I don't know, there may be still some who do that. They know they're... Year, some years ago, there was pretty popular handling. Why distorting scripture like that? And then, of course, this is just completely foreign to scripture. There was this also, uh, Pergamum had a temple to Zeus, considered their savior. So it just blinds people to the truth to be caught in these kinds of things um, that were all around them. Now, it also mentions the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. All right, now you're going to have to go back to the Old Testament again. Where do you find Balaam? Do you remember? In the Old Testament, there's an account of the king of Moab named Balak. This is recorded in the book of Numbers. Israel's out in the wilderness. And Balak wants Balaam, who's a, supposed to be a prophet of God, what does he want Balaam to do? Curse Israel. He wants Balaam to curse Israel. And so he goes through, the, and if you read the narrative, he's enticed with a payment and three times, and he says, he says no twice, and finally he says, okay, I'll go with you. And he tries to do the curse on Israel, and guess what happens? He can't do it. He cannot curse Israel. And so that attempt fails, but what does succeed is that Balaam is credited with giving advice to the women of Moab to go and seduce the men of Israel into their worship and into immorality. And there's a whole section in Numbers given to that whole uh, account, that whole scenario. 
So John's saying this goes back to that time when Israel was in the wilderness, should have been trusting God, should have been staying away from what that culture was trying to do to them, but many of them caved in. And if you remember, there was a plague, and one of the priests, Phineas, had to stop it, and it, it was a, a bad time for Israel in the wilderness when Balaam brought that teaching in. Um, so what's that have to do with Pergamum here? And there's the Nicolaitans again. They were mentioned earlier in Ephesus. If you break down the two names, essentially the names mean to overcome or consume people. Balaam, Lord over people. So it's an attempt to gain control of the thinking and the minds of the people through some means of seduction. Now, are we being seduced in some way by our culture, our society? Are we not finding that even major church groups are caving in and saying same-sex marriages are, are fine? Is that not happening? And now we've got the transgender issue to deal with. It's okay to live together, right? Does that not become acceptable? Not, not just to the world, but to the church. You see how we're being seduced? How we're being drugged into the thinking of the culture? So if you think against that, then you're considered odd, strange. You can't think like that. So they're having to deal with this kind of teaching that comes from these groups. And the call from Jesus is to repent. So what, what they were doing was a kind of uh, abuse of grace. Because notice I put up there, their teaching basically centered on this idea that, hey, you're free in Christ, so you're okay to go ahead and do whatever you want. That reminds me of Paul's passage in Romans where he says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? And what does he say? Absolutely not. That's not the idea behind grace. And yet these groups were coming into the church trying to convince people that, hey, you want Jesus, that's fine, but you can also do all this other. You can go to the temple feast and participate in what they're doing. You can eat the food sacrifice to their God. It's not going to harm you. You can participate in the immoral activities going on. It's going to be fine. And so it's a breaking down of relationship and of truth that God has given us in saying, just do it. Uh, if it feels good, do it. Is that a similar thing? Has that been around a while? Feels good, go ahead. This is what they were dealing with. So if you're a word, if you're a believer in Christ and you're in that city in that time period, and a and a family member or a friend has gone through the ritual, and in those days if you brought your sacrifice to the God, you got a part of the meat to to use for yourself, and you would hold a meal in honor of that God, and you'd invite friends and relatives in to share it with you. Let's say you're a believer and you've been invited to one of those feasts. They've sacrificed to their God, they've got this festival going on, and now you're invited to come and eat with them and celebrate this God. Now what do you do? What do you do with that? How far do you go? Or to put it into modern day terminology, what do you do when the company has the big party and you're supposed to go? And you know what's going to go on there. And you know that it's going to be a place of wild partying and drunkenness and who knows what else. Well, what do you do? How far do you go with that? You see what I'm saying? These are the issues that they face, but they're the issues we face. So the call is to repent. You don't abuse your grace in Christ. They were saying it's okay to do all of that. And remember that behind these idols is an unseen spiritual being. That's the reality that many people miss. Spiritual beings who are 
doing their best to try to keep us from that close relationship with God and with our Lord. Paul talks of the council in Acts 15 talked about these very kinds of things. They said, what do we do? We don't want Gentiles to have to become Jews. We don't want them to have to undergo the circumcision and the ritual. But there are certain things they do need to follow. These are simply moral issues from God from the beginning. And that is abstain from sacrifice, what's been sacrificed to idols from blood and from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality. They were urged to keep themselves from those things as well. Paul said in Corinthians, I bought I bet what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. He says very clearly, you're basically offering it to a demon, to a spiritual being. Do not want, you don't want to be participants with that. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. It doesn't work. You can't do both. Paul says in Romans 12, I'm urging you to what? Present your self, your bodies, as a living sacrifice to God. That's your spiritual order of worship. Be transformed. What does Jesus promise to the believers in Pergamum? Hidden manna. Well, we think of manna, we immediately think back to Israel in the wilderness, right? And God said, I'm going to give you manna. And how long did they get manna? The whole time they were in the wilderness until the day they crossed over into the promised land. And then we remember that, what did Jesus say about the manna? After he fed the 5,000, the group of people there, and there were leftovers, and then later in the temple, he taught them what that really meant. He said, oh, you want me to be king just because you, you fed your belly, you filled your belly. But I'm telling you what, I am the bread of life. Bread of life. I am the true man." the true bread of life. Jesus says, I will give you that bread. He also says, I give you a white stone and a new name. Now, there's some different ways of thinking about what the white stone means. Um, and it could be several of these. One is the idea that two friends are parting, and what they would do is divide a white stone in half, and they would each inscribe their name on one half and give it to the other one. Well, that's an interesting old picture. Also, some think the white stone was a part of voting. So if you got the white stone, you were acquitted. If you got the black stone, you're guilty. Well, that could be. Um, some think that the urine, which was on the high priest's garment, the ephod, was a white stone or a diamond that would help him determine the will of God. Whatever way that is pictured, the promise is you get this as a reward for being an overcomer, and you also get a new name. But when we come to Christ, we become what? Christ followers. Well, we use the term Christian. Uh, that's what we become. We have a change of name status. It's like going through a marriage where the woman, generally speaking, takes the name of the husband. We take on the name of Christ. In the Old Testament, there was numerous times where people's names were changed, right? Abram to Abraham, Jacob to Israel, and so forth. So Jesus promises here, you will get a new name. His manna, white stone, new name, to those who what? Overcome. That term overcome is in all the letters. You must be an overcomer. Again, John 6, Jesus clearly said, I am the bread of life. I'm not going to have much time to start on Thyatira. Let's give it a shot for two or three minutes here. Thyatira, a city of uh, a center of Apollo worship. Apollo was considered to be the guardian of the city. Um, patron god of many of the trade guilds in Thyatira. Again, they believe the emperor was the incarnation of the god Apollo. Um, but they kind of combined a lot of these gods and goddesses with emperor worship, so it all kind of ran together. Um, the commercial center, who can you think of in the book of Acts who is from Thyatira? Who? Lydia. It's up there. 
and nobody answered right away. Oh, it's right right there. <laughs> Lydia, X16, seller of purple. purple, purple fabric. They were known for their rich purple fabric that they developed from a special dye. So they had these trade guilds, and uh, they had one for leather, for pottery, for bakers, for bronze. Bronze was a very, very prominent trade guild in the city. In fact, you couldn't hardly make it financially unless you were part of one of the trade guilds, which in our day would be a union. union. Mm -hmm. Having a lot of trouble with the teachers' union back out there in the West, aren't they? Yeah. Unions, yeah. That's the thing in our day. Things haven't changed a lot, have they? Throughout the course of history, we're dealing with some of the same similar problems. But you couldn't make it very well unless you were there. So being in a trade guild meant you had to participate in their social activities. So if you come to believe in Christ, your life has changed dramatically like that, then again, what do you do? Are you going to go to the feast that they have in honor of these gods? Are you going to involve yourself in the drunkenness and immorality? Because in many of these temples, they would have uh, prostitutes going through the city, and they would have an uh, inscription on the bottom of their sandals that would give you directions to follow them. Follow me, follow me, follow me into the temple. You can satisfy your desire. So, again... We got a lot of similar stuff going on in our culture today. And then we have reference to Jezebel. We don't have time to get into her today, into what, what they taught through her, but if you think of Jezebel, what do you think of? Again, Old Testament? Not good. Not good. Who's the, who's the team that did a lot of damage to Israel? Her husband was king. I know, I put it up there and they didn't say anything. <laughs> Ahab and Jezebel, what they do? They brought Baal worship into the land. 850 prophets, can you believe it? Jezebel's father was a priest, a pagan priest up in Tyre, Sidon region, and she brought all this stuff into Israel. Israel kept running after these false gods, just kept running after them, thinking that's what's going to give them life. That's what's going to give them prosperity. It doesn't work. We keep running after other things. We just need a little more of this, a little more of that. Where can we find something that's going to really excite us? That's what they were doing back then. 850 prophets he had, and then, of course, you remember, and he talks about the deep things of Satan. Well, that can incorporate a whole lot of stuff. Uh, sorcery, witchcraft, meeting with the dead, uh, drug use, all kinds of things, deep things of Satan. And that is still going on today. Okay, so we're going to finish with Thyatira. If you can, read ahead, read into the rest of chapter 2 and 3, uh, and then we're going to jump into 4 and 5, which is really, really powerful worship material. So that's where we're headed. Hopefully we can finish up maybe with the seven churches here soon. Well, next week we won't because Scott will be here. Uh, Scott Springer is going to be here to update us on a lot of the work going on down there in El Paso in Mexico. So the week after next, we'll pick back up with the rest of Thyatira and the other churches. Okay?